Thank you, musicians. And uh, thank you to Moses and crew up the back there who are running everything. Now, Moses, can we have a test on our slides? Ah, great. It's working as you promised. My name is Andrew. In case you haven't worked it out yet, I come from Australia. And tonight, I want to talk about a hot topic. And that hot topic is what happens when we die. It is not only a hot topic, it's an important one. So just look at what Solomon had to say about this, and then we're going to pray and ask God to speak to us. This is what Solomon said. He said, better to spend your time at funerals than at parties. After all, everyone dies. So the living should take this to heart. Everyone dies. What Solomon is saying there is, there is certainty that we will die. Unless. <laughs> and that unless is really important. But what he asks us to do is to say this, so the living should take this to heart. What I am going to share tonight, for some it will comfort you. For others, it will disturb you. But what I'm hoping for everyone is that at the very least, you will be instructed in understanding what Jesus can do for you when you die. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are about to read your word we are going to speak about your Son. Unless your Holy Spirit opens our eyes and our hearts, nothing I say will have any impact. So Lord, our prayer is that as I read from your word, your Spirit will work, will open our eyes, and your Son will be lifted high to the highest place. And that everyone in this room would believe that he is the resurrection and the life. And that if we believe him in him, even if we die, we will live. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. What I'd like to do is just do three things. Look at what Jesus taught about what happened when you die, explain what his death and resurrection does for us, how it changes everything, and then thirdly, to just explain, if you believe in Jesus, what will happen the moment you die. But before I do that, I want to share a, an event. I was flying in Australia from Tasmania to Sydney. And I sat on the plane, and sitting next to me was a Chinese mother by the name of Summer. And with her was her three-year-old son, Sonny. And we sat and we greeted one another. We both lived in Sydney and we were going home. We took off, seatbelt sign went off, and they started bringing food around. Part of my ticket, I, I got a meal. But Summer and her son, Sonny, had no meal. So when the meal came, I said, give it to your son, I've already eaten. And as the meal was being handed to her, I, I started reading a book. We got chatting and she asked me the question, what are you reading? And the title of the book was, What Happens One Minute After You Die? <laughs> so I told her the title. Guess what she said? She said to me, so Andrew, what does happen to you one minute after you die? And I said to her, Summer, 
It all depends on what you do with Jesus while you're alive. And then she asked this question. Why does it depend on Jesus and not someone else? That is a powerful, powerful question. How would you answer that question? This is what I said to her. It depends on Jesus because he is the only person who has ever lived who predicted that when he died, he would rise again. And he is the only person who has ever lived that when he died, he rose himself up from the dead. So I said to Summer, I don't know about you, I don't know what you believe. But I've looked at many religions and I'm going to follow the one who can say I will die and then raise him up from the grave. That's who I will follow. Now I want us just to think for a moment. I'm from Australia. In Australia, largely a post-Christian country. I wonder if the batteries are going, Moses. Or if you can get me a handheld, just in case, and I'll turn this off. So I come from Australia, and in Australia we're a post-Christian country, and, thank you. What I'm, what I'm worried about is if it turns off, I will start speaking loudly and then if it comes back on, I will be shouting and, and it will be very loud. So I come from Australia, a post-Christian country. Most people in Australia are atheists. Who started the whole idea of a thought that this world was not created by a being, but by nothing? by chance and time. It was Charles Darwin. Now where is Charles Darwin at the moment? He's in the grave, right? If you are going to stake your life, will you stake it on someone who is in the grave? Do they have the authority to speak about what happens after you die? Now, I want to say this respectfully. I lived for 10 years in Indonesia. I have many, many Muslim friends. When it comes to life and death, they trust in the Prophet Muhammad and that they believe Muhammad will be able to show them the way to heaven. But very respectfully, I want to say and I want to ask, where is Muhammad right now? The Prophet Muhammad is in the grave. I lived for three years in Malaysia. 50 metres from my house, well, 100 metres from my house was a mosque. 50 metres from my house was a Hindu temple. Many mornings I would be woken up by trumpets and drums. And then 150 metres away was a Buddhist temple. And I would walk past and they would be burning joysticks. Now who initiated Hinduism and Buddhism? Siddhartha Gautama. And he taught a sevenfold way and reincarnation of getting to Nirvana. But very respectfully, I will ask this question. Where is Siddhartha Gautama? Charles Darwin cannot say, I am the resurrection and the life. He is still in the grave. The Prophet Muhammad cannot say, I am the resurrection and the life. He is in the grave. No one can say, I am the resurrection and the life except for Jesus. So when we ask this question, what will happen after we die, my suggestion, my belief is the best person to listen to is Jesus. So what I'd like you to do is to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. In your pew Bibles, 
The page is 1,113. And what we're going to look at is what Jesus says, what he teaches happens when we die. And what we read in verse 19, some people would call this, would say this is a parable. I would tend to say that it's actually a true story. It's a true story. It's not a metaphor. It's not a, a picture. The reason being is Jesus actually mentions people's names and he doesn't do that in any other parables. But regardless, whether it's a parable or it's a, it's a, a reality, it's teaching a truth. And this is what he said. He said, there was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen, linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his wounds. What we see here is there are two people, a rich man and a poor man. But what we also are about to see, two people, a rich man and a poor man, but one appointment, and that's death. One part of the Bible, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27 says, It is appointed unto man to die and after to face judgment. Rich or poor in this earth, we all have an appointment. And it's death. And so what we read is what happens here. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abram's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. Notice his first plea. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things and Lazarus in like manner bad things, but now he is comforted here and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able to, may, none may cross from there to us. And he said, then I beg you, Father, this is his second plea. I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He, will, he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Now I want you to notice these two men die. Stephen, you're just over there. Do you still have your string? Ah, uh, good. Can you bring it to me, please? Now, Stephen, earlier on, you did a play. In that play, who were you? I was actually Satan. Ah, he was Satan. He put a string down on the ground. I want you to understand. Thank you, Stephen. What happened at this time? A rich man dies. A poor man dies. They go to a place called Hades or Sheol. One is on one side with Abraham. The poor man is on one side with Abraham. The rich man is on the other side. One side, there is satisfaction and perfection. On the other side, there is torment. 
And he has two pleas, one for himself. What's his plea? Just send me some water. And Abraham explains, no, once you die and you are on your side, there is no change. We cannot relieve you of your torment. He realizes his future is bleak. So his second plea is, send someone to my brothers and tell them that they do not want to be where I am. And Abraham said something very interesting. He said he has Moses and the prophets. And then the rich man said, they won't listen to the prophets. And then Abraham said this. He said, even if someone comes from the dead. Now here's the question for us today. There is someone who has come from the dead. He's speaking. His name is Jesus. Will you listen to him? But I want you to understand there's two pleas here. But there's another truth we need to see here. There's two pleas. But there's one problem. No changing things after you die. That means today, that means you, everyone in this room, needs to make a decision. But I want you to understand, when Stephen was playing Satan, Satan wants you to believe that you can go from side to side. He wants you to believe you've got time. He wants you to believe this is not an important topic. He wants you to believe that this side is fun and that that side is not fun. On this side, in, in Psalm 16 verse 11, David talks about pleasures forevermore at God's right hand. They are all lies. They are all lies. And so as we read on, this is what we see. Death is a separation. When you die, there is a separation forever. What is that separation? There's a physical, there's a separation of your physical body from your soul, from the spiritual, immaterial part of you. It's separated. But depending on what you do with Jesus, there's a second separation. You are either separated from God forever and ever, or you are with God forever and ever. And there is no change after you die. There's a separation. Followed by a destination. Either a place of complete satisfaction or a place of total desperation. Do you believe that? Do you count that to be true? See, Jesus did not say, I am the reincarnation and the life. The truth is, once you die, there is separation. There is no second chances. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. In fact, later on, in the book of Revelation, this is what he said to John. He said this, Fear not, I am the first and the last. That means that Jesus has power over time. He says, and the living one. That means he has power over life. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. That means he has power over sin. The reason we die is because we sin. Stephen gave some examples of some sins. Lying. Everyone's lied. No one passes this test. These are acts of comm commission. What the Bible teaches is just one sin. It says for the wages of sin is death. Just one sin and you are separated from God forever and ever. And what Jesus says here is this. I have power over sin. See, the wages, the consequence of sin is death, but Jesus is the only one who has conquered death. And so he says here, I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. And then he says this, I have the keys of death and Hades. He determines 
your ultimate destination. And today, he gives you the privilege, he gives you the voluntary decision to decide what he will do on that day. See, Jesus is a gentleman. He will not force you to believe in him. Ultimately, he will let you make your decision. And when you make your decision, if you choose not to believe in him, when you stand before him, he will grant your decision. He will say, have it your way and be separated from me forever and ever in a place of torment that you do not want to be in. But if you stand before him and you have believed in him as the resurrection and the life, he does something for you. What he does is in his death he takes away all your sin and through his resurrection and his power he gives you all his goodness and when that happens now you can be with God forever and ever because he truly is the resurrection and the life. So let's ask the question, what impact did Jesus' death and resurrection have when we die? See, interestingly enough, if you look at this picture, before Jesus' death and resurrection, Hades, or Sheol, they're the Old Testament, New Testament words, what happened, it was one place, and there was a chasm that divided. We've, we've looked at that. But when Jesus died, things changed. When he died, what happened is, what we read in God's word is, when Jesus died on the cross, when he cried out, it is finished, all the sin is paid in full. And then he said to his father, into your hands I commit my spirit, several things happened. The earth shook. The curtain in the temple was torn from, bottom to, from top to bottom. But interestingly enough, do you realize? Old Testament believers in God, they actually rose out of their graves. And then on Easter Sunday, do you know what they did? They presented themselves in Jerusalem. That is the power of Jesus' death. See, when Jesus died, what happened is this, and then what we're taught in, in Ephesians is that when Jesus rose, he ascended to heaven, together with him, Old Testament believers who had believed in God, they went to be with God. Things changed when Jesus died. So what happens now? What happens now is this. If you die, there are no longer two compartments to Hades. If you die and you haven't trusted in Jesus, you go to Hades and you're separated from God and you wait until a final judgment. But if you have trusted in Jesus, the moment you die, you go straight into the presence of God. And then what we're told is that Jesus will return and there will be a great judgment day. The, the white, great white throne of judgment. And on that day, everyone who are in Hades who have not trusted in Jesus, what happens is they get cast, they get sent to a place the Bible calls hell forever and ever. Jesus' death and resurrection changes everything. Why is that? Because he is the resurrection and the life. So what do we learn? We learn this. If you are born once, you will die twice. But if you are born twice, you will die once. If you are born once, you will die twice. If you are born twice, you will die once. What does that mean? If you are born once physically, which everyone in this room has been born physically, if you trust in Jesus, what we're told is that you are born again spiritually. If you trust in Jesus, you are born twice. 
And if you are born twice, when you die, you will only die once. You will go straight to be with the Lord. Born twice, die once. If you are born physically, but you make a decision to trust in Jesus, and you will be born again spiritually, when you die, you go straight into the presence of God. But if you are born once, if you refuse to trust in Jesus, and you are not born again spiritually, you will die twice. You will die physically, and then you'll be separated from God eternally. Do you believe? See, there was a day in John chapter 11 when Jesus said these words. He said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. Notice that? Born twice, die once. He who believes in me, that is, has been born again spiritually, though he dies, lives. Born twice, dies once. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. And then he asks this question, do you believe this? This is my question to you today. Do you believe this? Do you believe Jesus is the resurrection and the life? And if you believe in him, you will be born twice and you will die once. Do you believe that? If you do, I have good news for you. I'm about to explain to you what will happen the moment you die. If you have not yet believed in Jesus, the invitation is to believe. Stephen did a little play. He didn't tell you that he was Satan. And he used a bit of string, and this string was a fence. You may say, I am not ready to believe in Jesus. I respect that. In that case, you might say, I'm standing on the fence. I'm not yet, not yet ready to believe. I understand that. I respect that. My invitation to you would be, come and see Jesus. Come and learn more about him. But I want you to understand something. If you were to die tonight, you would not be with Jesus. Because I want you to understand something. Satan owns the fence. So this is an important topic. This is an urgent topic. Now, I lived in, in Malaysia for three years and there were many Buddhist people there, Taoists, who worshipped their ancestors and they did not want to believe in Jesus because if they did that, they felt that they were not being loyal to their ancestors. I know that that can sometimes happen here in India, that if you believe in Jesus, I will no longer be loyal to my family. I want you to understand what we learned from Luke chapter 16. All your ancestors who have passed away, who have not yet trusted in Jesus, they would be like Lazarus. And tonight, they would want you to hear the good news about Jesus and they would want you to believe so that you would not be separated from God forever and ever. Do you believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. If you say, I'm not yet ready, my invitation is come and see, come and learn more, come and speak to whoever invited you tonight. But if you say, I do believe, I have believed, here is the good news. What will happen the moment you die? What will happen to us when we die? This is very quickly, and we, I won't explain it greatly. A moment after a believer dies, and I want to explain to you, this is not just theoretical for me. This is not just theological. This is personal. I have a sister who died when she was seven years old, but she had believed in Jesus. I have a father who just a few years ago died, and he believed in Jesus. And so this is very personal to me. This is what happened to them the moment they died. Angels usher your soul into heaven. Luke chapter 16, verse 22. And heaven becomes your forever home. 
The second thing that happens, you immediately enter God's presence. Paul talks about being absent from the body, but present with the Lord straight away. Number three, you are conscious in command of your faculties of thinking, feeling, speech, and memories. Remember in the story in Luke 16, the rich man still knew he had five brothers. He was conscious. This idea that you sleep, a soul sleep, it's not what Jesus teaches. You are conscious in command of your faculties. Fourth, you participate in magnificent worship with angels and believers before the throne of God and Christ. That is a, is a moment of seeing God in all his goodness and his greatness, in all his glory, you are worshipping him together with other people who have trusted in him, together with angels. That's when David talks about in Psalm 16 verse 11, at your right hand are pleasures evermore. That is what he's talking about. We have been created by God for God. We have been created to worship him, to gaze at his glory, to enjoy his goodness and greatness. That is pleasure forevermore. That's the fourth thing. The fifth thing, you are aware to some degree of activities and events on earth. This is a little bit of a controversial one. I can't be dogmatic. But based on these passages... It looks like there is some awareness of what is happening on earth. I don't think you know all the details, but there appears to be some awareness. And the seventh thing that happens is this. You will recognise and communicate with believers who preceded you to heaven. You will recognise and communicate with. You might say... What do you base that on? Well, there's a verse there. It's referring to the transfiguration when Jesus revealed his glory to three of his disciples and beside him were Moses and Elijah and Peter and the disciples, they recognised Moses and Elijah even though they had never met them personally, they recognised them and I don't think Moses and Elijah were wearing name tags. So what does this mean for me? The moment my father passed away, he moved into the presence of God, greeted by Jesus. And together with my father would be my sister. And together with them would be many other believers that my father had known personally, and what would have happened is they all would then gather and they would worship Jesus together, fully satisfied, pleasures forevermore, created by God for that moment. I have a mother. In a few weeks, in about a month, she will turn 84 years of age. Do you know what she sometimes says to me? It makes me a little bit sad, but it makes, me, it makes me sorrowful yet joyful at the same time. She says, Andrew, I can't wait to go home, to be with God, to be with your father, to be with Karen, and I can't wait because I know you will come and join me one day. How can she have that assurance? Because she believes in Jesus who is the resurrection and the life. What happens when we die? That depends on what you have done with Jesus while you are alive. Do you believe Jesus is the resurrection and the life? If you do, you are born twice, and what happens is you will die once. But if you have not yet believed, 
if you have not yet been born a second time spiritually made alive to God spiritually you have been born once and you will die twice you will die physically and you will die spiritually you'll be separated from God forever and ever so the question Jesus asks you tonight is this he says I am the resurrection and the life do you believe let's pray dear Heavenly Father we just think of a song that we've sung about you sending your son from heaven to earth Jesus left Jesus the only good perfect person who has never lied never cheated never stolen and he left heaven to do the one thing that he could not do in heaven and that was to die and that was to die in our place for every single one of us who has sinned and he did that and he rose again so that all that believe in him will live with him he said that to his disciples the night before he dies he said to them i am alive and you will be alive forevermore and lord we thank you and praise you that we can trust you you have given us such great evidence the life the death the resurrection and the ascension of your son and lord all of us tonight who have trusted in him we want to say thank you thank you for a savior thank you for a lord thank you for the person of Jesus who has shown us that he is the resurrection and the life. And Lord, if there is anyone here this evening who has not yet believed in Jesus, my prayer is that you would open their eyes to see how good and how great Jesus is, that he is the resurrection and the life, and that you will cause their friends who have invited them tonight to keep journeying with them and to keep pointing them to Jesus and my prayer Lord would be that there would be a day and that it may even be this day that they would believe that Jesus is the resurrection and, and the life and that they would pass from death to life that they would be born again spiritually that they would experience a relationship with you now that can never die that can never be conquered because Jesus has conquered death he's conquered the grave he's conquered sin he is the resurrection and the life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.